Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio. I'm your host, Deborah Bailey. And when I started this show in 2008, I was on a mission to promote women-owned businesses and help women succeed by providing resources and valuable tips from other women and men, small business owners. In each interview, my guests speak openly about their triumphs, the scary times, and tough decisions they had to make along the way. Women Entrepreneurs Radio is about showing women how to harness their natural strengths to achieve success on their own terms. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. And if you're listening to this on Podomatic, you can also go to WomenEntrepreneurSecrets.com and you can find links for the show on different platforms, including iTunes, uh, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you're on iTunes, it would be great if you could leave a review or at least give the show five stars uh, if you enjoyed it because all of the uh, feedback on iTunes, of course, helps the show to be found by more listeners. So I hope that you will do that. And also on WomenEntrepreneurSecrets.com, you can find a lot of blog posts of interest to women entrepreneurs. And you can find out how to become a guest if you're interested. And there's also information about guest posting on the blog. So that's something else that's offered for you. And also uh, written Q&A interviews if you have a business. Um, that you'd like to share. So there's a lot of opportunities there, so I hope you'll stop by and check it out. And also my website is thebaileycoach.com, and you can find out more about some online courses that I have and uh, book coaching services. They're all listed there. And I have some uh, more courses coming, particularly one about some publishing will be coming up very soon so um, if you stop by check it out you can sign up and then you would get um, an alert uh, when there's new content added and also you can stop by my website for my uh, books it's brightstreetbooks.com and there you'll see uh, my novels and you'll see links where you can purchase them and descriptions you can read about them and and check those out as well and I hope that you do so uh, we're going to get started today with my guest, Frances Ann Solomon. Is a Toronto. Hi. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. Uh, good, good. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no, I want to make sure to share what your your bio here. So okay, thank knows. you. I know you're going to go into more detail, but <laughs> I definitely want them to uh, to hear uh, a little bit more about you. But uh, Frances is Ann is a Toronto-based award-winning writer, producer, director, curator, and distributor in film, television, and radio, whose latest feature, Hero, began a world tour on February 28th, and she began her professional life at the BBC, where she was a successful television drama producer and executive producer. Frances Ann then moved to Canada, where she is a founder and CEO of the Caribbean Tales Media Group that produces, exhibits, and distributes Caribbean-themed content and she's currently artist in residence at the Ryerson University School of Image Arts and recently founded Cinefam that supports bold, original film stories by women of color creators worldwide. Uh, so I'm so happy to have you here, Frances Ann. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, there's just, uh, you know, so much that you have done and... Um, you know, it's really exciting work. And, you know, I just want to get started to ask, how did you decide to get started with, with your own company and, and really yeah, get the films out? Well, um, growing up in the Caribbean, which is, I grew up in Trinidad, um, being an artist or a filmmaker was not an option. We didn't have a film industry. Um, and, um, you know, as a middle-class brown girl we were or a middle class brown person generally the the our parents really wanted us to do well at school um get a degree and a career and be you know decent people be good people so either a teacher or you know if we were really high achievers than a lawyer doctor um but not an artist that was just seen as 
you know, um, almost as low as being a vagrant, you know, being a street mm-hmm. person, being a complete drain on your family, because how are you going to make money? Um, it was just not respectable at all. So I always wanted to write. I was always writing, but it was, it was in spite of, uh, all the, all the kind of pressure on me. But when I left, uh, Trinidad, I, I, um, I found that I was very, very unhappy and eventually um, went to theater school and specialized as a, as a director. And from there, I, I went to England, which is where I was born. And at that point in England, it was a really interesting time in the UK, um, the mid eighties. Um, there was race riots happening all over the country in Brixton Birmingham, Hansworth, Manchester, um, black people had had enough of racism Mm -hmm. and they were burning, you know, they were really burning the place down. Um, So the government in reaction were looking for, um, you know, black people to come into the professions, into the, into the media, to have a voice, to be, to represent. And I got a job at that time as a reporter at the, at the first black on the first black um, magazine, TV magazine program at the BBC. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was how I got into to media originally from with an arts background. And, um, and I, I, I worked my way up from there. That was kind of how I started. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like a lot was going on mm-hmm. at a certain time. And then you were able to, at that time, really get, um, an opportunity mm-hmm. yeah. in the midst of everything. Yeah, I, I did. I mean, I, I have to say it wasn't easy mm-hmm. um, because being, you know, at the time being among the first people of color inside the corporation, you you know, it was definitely a conflicted place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you were there apparently to have a voice, but at the same t- time, you weren't allowed to have that voice really. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it was very much a, a kind of a struggle and a conflict all the time. Mm-hmm. And so there was that. Um, th- yeah. So it was an opportunity, but it was also um, a fight and an initiation by fire. Not a lot of people survived that. Mm-hmm. You know? They didn't really want us to survive, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, but I did. I worked my way up through the BBC. After that experience in um, uh, as a reporter, um, I did the, what was then called the BBC training program, a two year program, which, you know, you trained in all the different aspects of the corporation from radio to news to drama, ended up in drama, um, as a story editor. Um, again, at that point, like drama was like the place where no people of color ever ventured in ever, 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 ever. It was totally mm-hmm. a lockdown, um, mm-hmm. you know, where British drama, costume drama, very you know british kind of enclave Mm -hmm. and i was a story editor um and so that was also very difficult but um but you know i again i I worked at the bbc for maybe 12 years i had a great boss who promoted me on the basis of merit for some reason he thought i was good Um, (laughs) i shouldn't put it like that i was good (laughs) and i was gutsy you know and he protected me he did protect me you know because people would come in to his office and and go you know like just walk past me because they didn't didn't see me and if i was sitting in meetings they would like literally say what is she doing here Mm -hmm. it was you know it was it was quite difficult, but he gave me quite a lot of freedom and encouraged me to develop work by people of color. So at that time, I started a strand of films by black filmmakers, as well as working for him directly mm-hmm. as a story editor. I started a strand of films by black filmmakers. Black in Britain at the time was everything that was not Anglo-Saxon, right? So black mm-hmm. was um, a political term that referred to um, black and minority ethnic people. So mm-hmm. it was, we were, it was black people. It was Indian people. It was, it was Chinese people. It was everybody who was not considered um, English at mm-hmm. the time. And so there was a great sense of, and you didn't differentiate between people from different islands or Africans and, and Caribbean people, or um, even though 
um, people from South Asia um, were culturally very different from us politically. We were on the same, in the same, um, you know, um, you know, side. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of solidarity, a lot of activism, um, and a lot of really great allies, alliances created. Um, But yeah, so I was very active in trying to open the door um, on a lot of on new voices and voices by people of color and stuff like that. There was quite a lot of good um, theater um, by 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 um, by black and 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 um, writers and directors in in England at the time, and but nothing in television. So that was kind of my mission. Mm-hmm. But eventually, you know, it became very frustrating because there was like a period of time where there was a certain openness to to uh, um, to difference, to diversity, to new voices, mm-hmm. and then the door closed. Um, so that I, I think I was there, you know, from about the mid eighties to the mid nineties. That was also the point, the period when in America we had directors like Spike Lee and and others, the Hudlin Brothers, and and um, and and a number of the other incredible black filmmakers had a voice Mm -hmm. at that time and so I'm not sure what the conditions were that created that that kind of explosion but the same thing was happening on the other side of the Atlantic Mm -hmm. Um, and here in Canada as well um, there was uh, Clement Virgo came up at that time but then the door just closed Mm -hmm. Um, and there was kind of a backward slide and a real backlash against diversity in Britain and I had to go. I couldn't handle it. It was heartbreaking to have been working in the industry for 15 years and, and now seeing all the gains that we had made just like going backwards, mm-hmm. like a serious backslide. Um, so I, at that point, moved to Canada where I thought there would be more um, openness and diversity and I discovered that there was not. Mm-hmm. But anyway, <laughs> I'd, done my, I'd done my time um, uh, working for a white corporation um, you know, a big, important white corporation. I trained. I'd had the best training in the world um, working at the BBC. Um, I'd been, you know, at the top of that of that organization. I was, I was, um, you know, the script executive and a producer and executive producer in the drama department, working directly to the head of drama. Mm-hmm. So across all the output of the BBC, and um, and so I had a I had a really great picture of how that organization works, what makes it tick, what makes it successful. And when I left the BBC, my goal was really, you know, I want to create an organization like that, that exists for people of color and specifically for Caribbean and Caribbean diaspora voices Uh like mine. Um, So when I came back to Canada, I immediately registered Caribbean Tales as a company at that time at that time as well the internet was just beginning to be a thing right Mm -hmm. at the turn of the century Mm -hmm. and there was all this talk about the potential of the internet to democratize you know um marketing Mm -hmm. i think like before the internet marketing was and production was Mm -hmm. It's absolutely, you know, under the control of people who could afford this incredibly expensive equipment mm-hmm. and in, afford incredibly expensive marketing outreach, which was, you know, um, you couldn't do it on the internet, right? Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden the internet was happening, digital technology. So I had this dream that I would start a British broadcasting corporation, you know, a Caribbean broadcasting corporation internationally, you know, for for Caribbean voices all over the world mm-hmm. um, that would be internet based you know mm-hmm. that was my dream but it was really I had seen that the BBC what they do is it's a vertically integrated um, pipeline mm-hmm. that creates uh, producers markets and sells content to a, to a, um, a rapt audience the British um, public love British television Mm-hmm. You know, it's like event uh, programming for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had that vision for for Caribbean Tales that we would create, produce, market, and distribute um, Caribbean mm-hmm. diaspora and Caribbean themed content to audiences all over the world. And you know, you have to think also that Caribbean people live all over the world, mm-hmm. and they're international. There are huge populations of Caribbean people, um, not just in the Caribbean, but you know in America, 
you know, in every major mm-hmm. American city, they're huge. I think in New York State alone, there are like six million people of Caribbean heritage. Mm-hmm. In, uh, in, um, in Canada, in Toronto, it is like 500,000 um, people of Caribbean heritage, according to the census. In Britain, huge populations of Caribbean people, even in Germany and also in Africa. So it, like, it, was, it was a vision of creating content for an international audience because we can't, we can't create content for Jamaica, right? We can't create content for Barbados. Mm-hmm. Or Antigua. These are tiny little populations. But if you can envisage our population as being global, mm-hmm. and invested in seeing themselves on screen wherever it appears, like on the internet, then you can begin to have a, a kind of viable um, business plan. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to shut up now because I've kind of rolled <laughs> forward. No, that's <laughs> great. I'm... <laughs> I'm just like enthralled to you, really. <laughs> so yeah, any questions? <laughs> yeah, I could keep going. <laughs> well, that's that's the point, right? <laughs> You're yeah. supposed to keep going, but I think okay. yeah, go ahead. It's, it's so interesting. You know, I just want to say I think it's so interesting when you're talking about like the corporate um, uh, in, environment that may. In one hand, say we want these voices and we want these contributions, but then it finds a way to, um, I guess the status quo always finds a way back um, or to maintain itself, um, not really to be open to these other voices and, and ways of doing things that could really be extremely profitable, but the status quo is like, you know, this is what we've always done, so we're not going to have that. And it's just also, um, you see things going on right now in Hollywood, um, and definitely a lot of, I guess, fighting or struggling or, or whatever, where there are some people now looking at, like, say, the success of Netflix, which, you know, right now appears to be really opening up the doors for other voices. And now you're starting to see some pushback from Hollywood kind of saying, well, you know, that's streaming or that's not really movies, that's really TV, it shouldn't get Oscars, it should just get Emmys. You know, they're, they're now starting to notice, I think, due to the success, that this is a threat to the established order. And now it becomes, okay, now we have to find ways to undercut this. So, um, you know, what you're saying, it keeps getting played out in different places, you know, it, it, mm. it, they keep wanting to, um, I guess, kind of take everything back to when it was comfortable for a certain group, as opposed to now letting it be open, because if you did, then everybody can make money. And I don't think that the powers that be can really understand that or want to, mm. um, you know, so what you're saying, I, I really can, um, I can get that you know, as far as what I'm seeing here and also um, uh, what I what I see in the publishing industry, um, which is another industry that really looks like it doesn't want to change at all. And, um, you know, they're saying uh, early about self-publishing, it, the technology is there for people to take charge now and say, I'm not going to wait for this industry that's pretty much entrenched and has, has not changed very much at all mm-hmm. to let me in this door because they really aren't going to. So I have to create my own house and my own door. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, that the technology allows a lot of people entrance that didn't have it before, but Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that more people realize that because I still see a lot of people still waiting at the door Mm -hmm. and not seeing that they do have more in their hands and they may have had than people before us may have had, Mm -hmm. you know, so what you're saying really, I think, says a lot across the board, a lot of industries, particularly entertainment. Um, and right now you're seeing all these changes go on and all these things go on. And, and it's interesting to see what the reactions are. So um, even though what you're describing, you know, was, was like say the eighties or whatever, um, it's an ongoing struggle. <laughs> for sure, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's an ongoing struggle is just the point I, I wanted to make, but you know, I want you please continue about, the Caribbean Tales Media Group, because I want to hear more about, you know, what, what, how do you, how you set this up, and, and what are the things that, that yeah, it, it's doing. So, yeah. So in in the okay. So first of all, 
we were doing production mm -hmm. and um and we were um we had an online platform for streaming even like in, in turn of the century like mm -hmm. um early 2000s we had a an, a kind of multimedia magazine online that we published monthly mm -hmm. um with with you know written content and audio visual content and audio content and graphic design content um yeah so that 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 was there and then um in 2006 um one of our local partners here um said to me you have so much content why don't you do a film festival i'll we'll support it you know you can it, it, it was a guy who had a music festival so he was looking to diversify his uh, you know his the content available for his audiences mm -hmm. he said why don't we have a film festival with your content so i said sure that sounds okay so he got me a, a cinema for free um, and we had this film festival, um, which was the first Caribbean Tales film festival. Mm -hmm. And like a light bulb went off in my head. I was like, oh my God, because at the time it, it and still, it's really, really, you know, you're dependent on film festivals mm -hmm. to accept your work and to screen it well and to bring audiences to it and stuff like that like his the actual live experience nothing can really match it mm -hmm. so um i was a light bulb went off for me and i thought i can do this myself <laughs> <laughs> i just right. sit around waiting for people <laughs> to like or not like my films which exactly. i'm convinced are brilliant <laughs> um, that people right. want to see i can have my own film festival so that was the beginning of the Caribbean Tales International Film Festival, which is now in its 15th year. The mm. following year, I partnered with the Trinidad um, High Commission and um, film company in Trinidad, the film um, commission in Trinidad. And they, to bring together Tr Trinidad and Tobago filmmakers from all over the world and mm. show, and we, I think we show like 30, 40 films from, you know, from the past and the present by, by Trinidadian filmmakers um here and, and we showed we did it here in in canada we had a spotlight on horace Sove and christopher laird and you know it was just a great opportunity to say actually we've had amazing filmmakers always you know and great mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. that was right following year i partnered with jamaica jamaican high commission and the jamaican film commission um which was amazing too because brand jamaica is has its own kind of momentum you know mm -hmm. and and, and and star power so that was when I thought oh wow and um and then the following year we partnered so through with uh, the university here the Caribbean studies department of the university so through this process I began to um build relationships with communities of interest basically mm -hmm who had the same kind of, you know, synergistic interests as, as I did. Um, and so over time, what we've managed to do is like really put together a partnership model of exhibition of uh, films, of diverse films. And we've become really, really good at engaging audiences. Now we're in, we're in our 14th year with the festival. But the other thing that, that came up at that point was after a few years of that was that A, there was not that much content to continually have festivals to show, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so we needed to create some sort of engine for the generation of new content. And B, um, you know, it, we weren't actually, we, we, it wasn't actually solving the problem of viability of content. It wasn't enough to show films. In other words, it, we had to figure out a way of ma of films making money, you know, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order for it to be sustainable. And so in 2010, we did two things. We started the Caribbean Tales Incubator Program to bring together filmmakers from all over the diaspora to develop work, to, to have them think about developing world-class content. Mm -hmm. And two, we also um we also started um the Caribbean Tales worldwide distribution company um so those are two those are the three key, kind of key vehicles that we have which is uh four uh production the festival um the incubator program to develop original content and then the distribution program to distribute content and at this time, uh, both those two new companies in 2010 are now almost 10 years old. Um, and we, we have a distribution catalog of around 400 films 
from uh, filmmakers from around the diaspora and the incubator is going strong. Like every year we bring together between 10 and 12 filmmakers from all over the world to kind of, yeah. and now we also, we've also developed um, accelerator, short accelerator programs in Cuba, Belize and uh, South Africa um, with partners in those territories and the the kind of best of those accelerators come to the table and participate in our Toronto incubator, which we do in September in partnership with the Toronto International Film Festival. So that's that. Mm-hmm. Then, wow. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> 2013, we did a video on, we did a streaming video on demand um, service in order to make our content accessible online the distribution content and then that was that's really caribbean tales so yeah the wow. um, yeah production <laughs> so then i started hasini farm three years ago new company mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so what's that about <laughs> no don't stop what's that about <laughs> well i guess um i didn't i really began to feel very strongly about four years ago that as a woman of color in the in the entertainment industry this was really the the kind of uh, place where where the most struggle was happening Mm -hmm. um so um so yeah i started cinefam as a way as a platform of support for women of color filmmakers all over the world Mm -hmm. i found honestly i found that I'd spent a few years trying to make, as a black filmmaker in the entertainment industry, it's very, very isolating. Mm -hmm. So I'd set up these companies, but I felt that they were ghettoized for the most part. This was before Oscar So Bright, White, and all that kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. we were, it's like apartheid. You know, you're here doing content by people of color, and then the industry is doing what it does with exclusively white filmmakers Mm -hmm. and exclusively white content. Mm-hmm. so after and I didn't want to work for another white corporation mm-hmm. but I began to feel that it was necessary to build alliances with um, not just with other black filmmakers and other filmmakers of color all over the world but somehow to build bridges into the white community and initially I thought that the way to do that would be as a woman to build um, bridges with other women um, in the industry white women Mm-hmm. And that sort of just didn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's why I started seeing my fam. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make alliances with other women of color. Right. Um, right. Because they're amazing women. So, yeah. Right. And I think that a lot of people, a lot of times people who are um, not, I guess not heard in the mainstream have a lot of, I'm trying, trying to find the right word for it, but there's a lot of emotion and energy and drive that you have to have when you really have to keep pushing harder. Mm-hmm. And also I think there's a lot of creativity that comes out of all of this as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, though you really, rather not have the frustration and the struggle and all that all the time. There's also a creativity that, that comes out of that, that you have to create, you know, you have to have in order to, to get things done, you know, mm-hmm. cause you may have to find different ways to accomplish your goal. Yeah. You and, certainly do. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that kind of encourages a certain creativity that I think a lot of people have who have had to, um cultivate it i guess you could you know it's a good way to put it well yeah. i think resourcefulness for sure oh yes you, you know do you have to have the attitude that yes. if a door closes there's going to be there's got to be some way of getting in that in there exactly some other way there's another way there's always another way you have to have the attitude that there's always another way and that's it because you have you know you may not have the funding or you may not have all those other things in place. You may not have the relationships because you can't really, you haven't been able to build, uh, you know, as you were saying, the, the connections into these other, I guess, circles of power, you know, whatever you want to describe them as. So you have to find ways to accomplish your task that mm-hmm. may be 
no one's sitting there handing you all this money or exactly. <laughs> distributing your work, you know, like other yeah. things are yeah. distributed. So you yeah. have to come at it from a different, a different direction. And exactly. like I, yeah, everything you're saying, you know, can really apply, you know, as I said before, to publishing or probably just about any, um, you know, industry where people are trying to make these inroads now um, is that you have to, you're forced to have to kind of think out of the box in other ways mm -hmm. that maybe others don't have to or maybe aren't used to having to think because mm -hmm. they haven't hit those same obstacles. So you're like, okay, how can I get this done on, on less money? And how mm -hmm. can I maybe have to learn this and learn that and learn that because now I have to do a lot of it or maybe I'm training other people who may want to be trained, mm -hmm. don't have the skill set or maybe aren't exposed to that. Mm -hmm. and how to keep the door open for them as well so there's a lot you know there's a lot going on but I think out of it is a lot that can come out of it a lot of positive can come out of it if we just keep keep moving forward but of course you know the stress and strain and frustration everybody's not going to make it through exactly everybody's not going to do that because of what is a point where people are just like okay I've had enough <laughs> exactly. you know and I'm not saying that to blame them I'm saying it's it's not for the faint-hearted, um, unfortunately. That's, yeah. that's really the nature of it. Yeah. But so, um, Francis, Anne, why don't you share a little bit about your film, Hero? So Hero is really, it's about um, Ulrich Cross. It's a, a, what we call a biofiction. It's a hybrid feature film, documentary feature film. Um, doc, a hybrid in the sense that it's part documentary, part fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and the story behind it is as follows. In 2010, um, a friend of my family called Desmond Allen got in touch with my mother and he was dying. So he, he, he was calling all his friends and saying, this is, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do this when I'm gone. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, he called my mother and he said, I want you to make a film about a red cross and um, my mom took this on, you know, this deathbed mm -hmm. um, promise on very seriously. And in her 70s, my mother, um, amazing, amazing mother, became a film producer. She raised mm -hmm. a bunch of money and I got involved in the film in order to help her out. And at first I wasn't that interested in making a film about Albert Cross. I knew he had been, I knew him. He was also mm -hmm. a friend of my family in Trinidad. But um, I knew that he had served in the Second World War, which really that wasn't really a story I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not impressed by the fact that, you know, these endless stories about, oh, black people can can um, fight in white people's wars too. It's kind of amazing. Oh, we're equal to them. Seriously, we are. We can fight too. We can die. We can die for white people's causes. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. No, I'm sick of it. Okay, I've had it. I'm over it. So <laughs> I wasn't that keen on telling that story. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, why? Why? What is it in us that we have to, oh, look, look, we can die for you, too. Like, please, come on. Can you have some self-respect? It's, you know, there's so many stories left yeah. unfold. <clears throat> so, <laughs> yeah. so anyway, I began to research him more deeply and I discovered that after the war, there were a lot of interesting things happening, happening in England mm -hmm. and in the U.S. actually. Um, there was uh, the birth of what was then called the Pan-African Movement, mm -hmm. um, led by incredible people like George Padmore and C.L.R. James and Marcus Garvey and mm -hmm. W.E.B. Du Bois and all those amazing men mm -hmm. and women like uh, Claudia Jones and um, Amy Ashwood Garvey. Mm -hmm. um, so Alric was recruited by George Padmore, who was also from Trinidad, who was the advisor to Kwame Nkrumah, who, who mm -hmm. was to become the first president of Ghana. Mm -hmm. He was recruited to go to Ghana on independence to help with the transformation process. Um, and what what emerged from that was really the story, um, incredibly to me moving story, of the role of Caribbean professionals in the African independence movements after, you know, on independence. So Ulrich went to Ghana in 1957. He was on the ground in Ghana when independence came. And then he was like, you know, 
in, in, involved in the whole rewriting of the constitution from a colonial document to a kind of liberation document that empowered the people and, and, you know, took back the resources, all those, you know, really nitty gritty issues like mm -hmm. land ownership and resource ownership and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, that had to be disentangled from colonial ownership and greed right? Mm -hmm. And put back into the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. Those were like life and death really issues at the mm -hmm. time. And lawyers were central to it. So he, he, were, he was in Ghana as a lawyer. And then Nkrumah sent him to, um, to Cameroon, which had just become independent, um, where he became the attorney general in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then Nkrumah sent him to Congo, um, as a as a kind of envoy to advise him on what was actually happening on the ground uh, when when Lumumba was murdered, mm -hmm. whether Ghana should intervene militarily, and after all of that, he went to Tanzania, um, invited by another Trinidadian um, who was serving as the Chief Justice in Tanzania. He went to East Africa um, as a High Court judge, and he. And, and Tanzania was this incredible place as well. Mm -hmm. So through the film, what I learned and, and hoped to show was this moment in time where Africa was, you know, these incredible leaders were harnessing the power of the diaspora mm -hmm. to liberate the continent from colonial rule. Um, and they had a vision of, of what they called the United States of Africa, that all Africans all over the world and on the continent would come together to, you know, repair the damage of colonialism and, and make Africa rich and mm -hmm. profit, profitable mm -hmm. for everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is like a really inspirational moment. And the extent to which they were also undermined from mm -hmm. the beginning right. by the vested interests of, of mm -hmm. Europe and America. But so um, that's a story, yeah, yeah and it's, it's a wonderful story. Wow, that's a completely different story. Yeah, it's a completely <laughs> different narrative. Only a different story. So people people went to see the film and they're like, oh, you know, some people were like, you know, um, I have to say a very minor, minority of people, like a couple of people. I thought it was about the war. Like, <laughs> Missed the point totally. No. I just threw that in to say, yeah, he did that. Okay. Right. Can we move on? <laughs> Moving along. Uh, <laughs> You'll notice that it took exactly 30 seconds. <laughs> right? That was part of the potted biography. All right? <laughs> oh, my God. That's no, but the reaction has been really great. People really love it. People uh, love it. They say, you know, there a lot of people say not only that it's great filmmaking, which I'm very gratified about, but also that, you know, they had no idea. Right. You know, that our histories, our stories are so, mm -hmm. are, it, although some people said they knew pieces of it. Do you know what I mean? Like all of us mm -hmm. have family or friends who are somehow, you know, mm -hmm. involved with the, um, the African liberation movement in one mm -hmm. way or another. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard stories that so-and-so or such-and-such, you know, went off to Ghana, but we don't know the context we don't know right. how that what happened mm -hmm. we we have no no sense of the big picture in mm -hmm. terms of that was a seminal moment in time you know mm -hmm. which we should all learn about as part of our education instead of learning about the kings and queens of england you know like when we learn about slavery we don't learn about the incredible way that african people fought tooth and nail right from the beginning to free themselves mm -hmm. and the battles they fought and the heroes of that, those revolutions, we learn about William Wilberforce and how he set the law in motion to mm -hmm. emancipate the slaves, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but not that, you know, African people across, across the Caribbean and America, you know, put them to flight. Right. It was, couldn't be profitable any longer because, you know, they, they, they were losing so much in the rebellions that were happening across, mm -hmm. across, you know, so they were like, okay, we, this is not working. And that's why you need different voices with narratives because different voices are going to tell their own story and not go with the same old, same old, same yeah, old. Exactly. That is quo and so th that is usually just not even the truth. It's but, not the truth. It's not the know? truth. It's like when they talk about independence, they talk about how 
you know, Britain and France gave independence right. to the cabinet. Bullshit. They right. gave their language. They did not give anything. <laughs> right. That's right. They didn't give anything. And they stopped us as much as they could. They did everything they could That's to prevent right. us from taking back what was ours. And they still are doing that. Like I said, you can't, we can't wait for other people to say, okay, now you can come in and tell your story. You just have to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to have to do it. You can't wait um, for your turn to mm-hmm. be told it's okay now. You have to do it. And that's the only way it's going to, it's going to happen, in my opinion. When you do find these kinds of things, it's just like, wow, you want more. Exactly. You want it creates to... a hunger. Yeah, it does. Because you, you realize what you've been missing. You know this a story there that you need to hear or history that you were unaware of. And mm-hmm. then when you find it, you're like, well, where has this been all the time? And why didn't mm-hmm. I know this? Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask if you could share where people can find you and your website and, you know, how they can find out more about your film. Okay. So my was my personal website. As at my artist website, francisansolomon.com, Caribbean Tales Media Group. Um, you can go to caribbeantales.ca or caribbeantalesfestivals.com, uh, caribbeantalesincubator.com, Cine Fam, which is our, our company that supports women of color filmmakers worldwide. We have a suite of activities that happen every year um, to support uh, women of color filmmakers. That's cinefam.ca. Cinefam is a Haitian Creole world word, meaning mm-hmm. women of color. Women mm. of film, women mm-hmm. of film. Hero, you can find out where Hero is screening and buy tickets at heroalrickcross.com. And upcoming, we've got um, a theatrical run in Toronto, Ottawa, and then we're um, launching the world tour in, in the UK on May 18th at the British Film Institute. Mm. Then Stagana, where we'll be having our gala return there. You know, this has been a wonderful conversation, and Thank I'm you. sure we could go on and on oh, <laughs> because there's so many things to discuss. For those people listening who may feel, you know, I'm, I'm interested in entering the film industry, but wow, I don't know even where to start. What's some advice you could give to women who want to enter the film industry? Well, I was talking about it this morning. A lot of the time I've taken on big challenges because of the obstacles that, that were in, in my path in, in terms of doing it the conventional way. So, for example, I've, I created the Caribbean Tales Media Group because, you know, working for the BBC, I realized that it was going to be impossible mm-hmm. to really penetrate the mainstream, you know, institutions. And I took it on with a drive and a passion to, but kind of like the little company that could, you know, mm-hmm. not really deep down believing that I could ever achieve the vision that I set myself but determined to do it anyway because I profoundly believe that we deserve those those opportunities mm-hmm. and so what's incredibly gratifying is being successful mm. like success success is, makes you feel good it makes you feel good it makes you feel like things are possible in the world and so that would be my advice to anybody with a big vision know that you can succeed it's hard. I, I cannot lie. You can die trying, mm-hmm. but um, you can also succeed. And there's nothing like standing at the top of a mountain and looking back where you've come and going, wow, I did that. Mm-hmm. I did that. I climbed that mountain and I'm now standing toe to toe with anybody else. Mm-hmm. So that's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> And that's fantastic advice. And you've certainly been through the ups, the downs, and kept pushing on. Mm -hmm. And you're certainly an example of that. So I'm really happy to speak with you and and hear your insights and and everything that you've created and you continue to create. And I'm just so happy that I had this opportunity to speak with you today. I'm so thankful that you are out here doing your thing because that's what other people coming along are going to see that and that's going to help them now to realize they can do it too so thank you for your important work thank you for providing this um this forum of access to to exchange and to share ideas it's it's really great and essential so thank you well you're welcome and thank you too (laughs) okay (laughs) we thank each other 
Oh my gosh. Well, you know, um, everyone, I know you enjoyed this show. I know you've learned a lot. And um, those of you who are interested in filmmaking, I know you got a lot out of this. So please make sure you stop by uh, Frances Ann's website, check out her movie, check out her work, and see what you can also do yourself. So um, once again, it's welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. I'm so glad to be joining us today. And uh, we will see you again next time. Bye-bye now. Okay, bye. Thanks for joining us. You can also join in the conversation on facebook.com slash women entrepreneurs and on the website womenentrepreneursecrets.com. And don't forget to listen in on dvcoach.podomatic.com and on iTunes.